Come on and praise the Lord, everybody. The Bible says that this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad about it. If anybody's glad on this Wednesday, on this Revival Wednesday, still celebrating our pastor's anniversary Wednesday, why don't you praise the name of the Lord? Why don't you lift up your voice? Put a clap in your hands. Put a dance in your feet. Come on, come on. Praise the Lord. Everybody. The Bible says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. I'm by myself. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Come on and put a sing on your lips right now. Let's go to the Lord. Worship him on today. Amen. Hallelujah. What an awesome and mighty God that we serve. The Bible says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Do me a favor. If you in the chat, go ahead and just put a smile or a heart because we are excited to see you all virtually. We thank God for our amazing pastor. And this is going to be an amazing month. All right. So do me a favor. Let's travel just a little bit old school ways. All right. Amen. Hallelujah. You know this, help us sing it where you are. Oh, the Lord is blessing me right now. Oh, right now. I said the Lord is blessing me. Oh.
Amen. I hope you're feeling blessed that you're staying safe wherever you are, whether in your car or your cubicle or in your living room. But uh, our prayer is that you continue to be and stay blessed. Amen. Amen. And as you were, as you know, this is Revival Wednesday, Revival Wednesday. And this afternoon, we are going to be blessed by a a spoken word from the pastor, Howard John Wesley. So after this brief video as an introduction, um, my prayer is is that you receive manna from on high, a blessed prophetic word from him as we still revive in this moment of celebration. Amen. Amen. The The Reverend Reverend Dr. Dr. Howard John Wesley Wesley is the exciting, gifted, and anointed senior pastor of the historic Alfred Street Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia. A courageous, dynamic, and visionary leader, he is only the eighth pastor in the church's 217-year history of worshiping Christ while serving mankind. A native of Chicago, Illinois, Dr. Wesley is the product of the University of Chicago Laboratory Schools and graduated magna cum laude from Duke University with a Bachelor of Science in Biomedical and Electrical Engineering. While in medical school, Dr. Wesley yielded to the call of God and walked away from a path to a medical career to attend seminary at the prestigious Boston University School of Theology, where he was a Martin Luther King Jr. scholar and a summa cum laude graduate in Biblical Studies and African American Religious History. He received received his Doctor of Ministry in Preaching from Northern Baptist Seminary. Dr. Wesley is the son of the late Reverend Dr. Alvin and Dr. Helene Wesley and represents the fourth generation of Baptist preachers in his family. His sons, Howard John II, affectionately known as Deuce, and Cooper Reese are the greatest joys of his life. God that we serve we give God glory all over this place all over this building Hallelujah! in the chat if you could just lift up your hands and just thank God for how far he's brought you because there's no God like our God Hallelujah.
looked high and low Still couldn't find nobody Nobody greater It's nobody greater Yeah, it's nobody greater than you uh, Oh, hallelujah Pastor F. Bruce Williams, the leadership of Bates Memorial, the family of Bates. Grace and peace be unto you from God who loves us as a father and a mother. And Jesus Christ, who alone is our resurrected, our risen and our returning redeemer. Listen, y'all, let me start by sharing the lament and sorrow in my heart that I don't get to come to Louisville to preach this sermon live. I love coming to Bates Memorial, one of the greatest, friendliest, most hospitable churches in the kingdom of our Christ. And that's no small part due to the laughable, lovable character of your pastor, the F. Bruce Williams. Pastor Williams, you're my brother from another mother, man. I love you. And I thank God for our friendship and the invitation to be part of this virtual revival. During this season of pandemic, as we're adjusting to new ways of worshiping God, there's a sermon I want to share with you that I pray will bring hope, healing and blessing. It comes from the midst of a series that I preached recently here at Alfred Street about how God sometimes engineers endings. The sermon I want to share with you tonight is simply called Mizpah Moment. You remember that Mizpah, may the Lord watch between me and thee while we're absent one from another. And I want to examine how and why it is that God separates us from people and re-examine that passage and see that the Mizpah moment is not a way of cussing someone out with a sanctified middle finger, but it's actually a way of calling a truce, a way of moving into your purpose and God's plan for your life. So my prayer tonight is that both hope and healing will come to someone who's in that moment where God is engineering an ending. And my prayer is that Mizpah moment will be a blessing unto you. Beloved, grace and peace be unto you from God who loves us as a father and a mother. And Jesus Christ, who alone is our resurrected, our risen, our reigning and our returning redeemer. I'm grateful to God for this day that the Lord has blessed us with because I'm excited to get back into the series. May the Lord watch. Let's bow and be in prayer as we open our hearts to receive what the word of God would plant into our lives and into our living. God, how grateful we are that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. In moments when life is confusing and decisions are difficult, we found strength in your word, direction and guidance. I pray, O oh God, that you would anoint the teaching and preaching of your word, that it might be edifying to all who have an ear to hear. Remind us that in due season we shall reap if we do not faint or grow weary. Lord, enter into this moment. Speak to our lives. In the blessed name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. As you all remember, a few weekends ago, before we took our pause for Pentecost, we began this new series entitled, May the Lord Watch. And the premise of the series is that really God grooms us and grows us and graces us to be used in relationship. God develops us in isolation, but God always has a way of fulfilling his purpose and his assignment through the relationships that God places us in. In a real sense, God purposes relationship. And Howard Thurman was right that the people in your life determine not only where you are going, but ultimately if you will ever get there. Hopefully you remember that the same way God purposes relationship, the devil has a way of perverting relationship. The one of the enemy's quickest ways to keep us outside of the will of God and from walking in our assignment and living out our destiny as created by God is to partner us and place us in relationship with the wrong people at the wrong time that cause us to sacrifice our destiny for their emotional well-being. And because of that, because we are relational in our creation, 
And because Satan can pervert what God has purposed, God ultimately, at seasons in our life, has to come in and engineer an ending. We serve a God who specializes in breakups. We serve a God who knows how to call something to its final end. We serve a God who knows how to put permanent space between you and someone that is not good for the destiny that God has called you to walk in. God has a way of saying this season is over. As a matter of fact, there's somebody listening right now. You can look back over your life and you can see a moment when now in retrospect, the hand of God was at work in bringing a relationship, a friendship, a partnership to its end. You didn't like it at the time. It didn't feel good at the time. It may have broken your heart in that moment. You may have cried yourself to sleep. It wasn't what you prayed for. But as you look back now at what God brought to an end, you can thank God for breaking up and engineering an ending. In a real sense today, I'm looking for some grown folk who can look back over your life and see that there was someone or something you were attached to and you thought you could never make it without them. And here you are years later, by the grace of God, singing like Mary J. Blige, I'm doing just fine. There's somebody today you can look back over someone you thought was necessary, whose value you overestimated in your life. And now here you are, by the grace of God, stronger, better, living your life in joy. And you can sing like my good old sister Beyonce, you found the good in goodbye. Is there anybody watching who knows that God can engineer an ending? The struggle we have is seeing the signs and the signals that God is calling it to an end, accepting the will of God, and learning to walk away in a way that honors God. So we began this series in part one by looking at our Lord and Savior Jesus, looking at how he intentionally puts himself in relationship with 12 disciples. We examine the calling of the first four, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And in Jesus' selection of those four, he pulled out some characteristics of the people God wants connected in your life. I want to remind you today, as I did two weeks ago, that recognizing you need help is not a sign of weakness. It's the discerning of greatness. Because the reason you need help is that God is doing something bigger in your life than you can handle all by yourself. And so God calls us into relationship. God wants to partner you with people who are partnered to people because it's not just about relationship. It's also about network. God connects you to people that really want to see you prosper and do well. God wants you surrounded by people who don't limit the possibilities of today based on the failures of yesterday because they walk by faith and not by sight. God wants you to be surrounded by people who are humble and remind you that it is only by the grace of God and the mercy of God that you've arrived where you are. God has a way of connecting us with people who are willing to release you from their relationship if it's in your best interest for your walk with God. And finally, beloved, you need some people in your life who are concerned with legacy, who are not just living day in and day out to eat, drink, and be merry, but are trying to leave a legacy and change this earth and do something for the generations that come after them. What is going to be your legacy? As we pick back up in this series, May the Lord Watch, I want to invite you to an engineered ending that we see in the book of Genesis. So many times in scripture, you find these places where God is pulling people apart. And one of the most instructive ones comes to us in Genesis chapter 31. The 31st chapter of Genesis is worthy of a devotional read. I'm going to encourage you this week to read it from verse one all the way through verse last. But for the sake of preaching, I want to begin reading in verse number 44 
out of the New Revised Standard Version of God's Holy Word. Genesis chapter 31, beginning in verse 44. You should already be there. If you have difficulty finding the book of Genesis, I need you to email me so we can have a talk. Genesis 31, beginning in verse 44. Listen for the word of the Lord. Come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. And Jacob said to his kinfolk, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap, and they ate there by the heap. Laban called it Jagar Sahadutha, but Jacob called it Galid. Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me today. Therefore, he called it Galid. And the pillar, Mizpah. For he said, and you know these words, may the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent one from the other. If you ill treat my daughters or if you take wives in addition to my daughters, though no one else is with us, remember that God is a witness between you and me. Then Laban said to Jacob, see this heap and this pillar, which I have set between you and me. This heap is a witness and the pillar a witness that I will not pass beyond this heap to you. And you will not pass beyond this heap to me to do harm. May the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. And Jacob offered a sacrifice on the height and called his kinfolk to eat bread. And they ate bread and tarried all night in the hill country. Early in the morning, Laban rose up and kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. Then he departed and returned home. They went to Mizpah, which means, may the Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent one from another. Today, I want to talk about a Mizpah moment. A Mizpah moment. Mark, what happens in Genesis 31, you know, actually has its origins in chapter 27. To get a full context, you need to read from chapter 27 all the way through the end of chapter 31. And what you read in Genesis 27 through 31 is literally a hot mess. Beloved, you don't have to watch any reality TV. All you need to do is read the Bible. And when you read Genesis 27 through 31, you will find a story of deception and conflict, of rivalry and jealousy, of sex and money. It's juicier than anything else you can see on television. You're going to read it, but allow me to give you some cliff notes, a little background so we don't miss the breakdown. If you get back to chapter 27, everything starts with what happens between Jacob and his twin brother, Esau. You've read the Bible. You know that Jacob, his name literally means trickster. Jacob is a con man. Jacob is a manipulator. Jacob is a deceiver. And he does what his name says he's going to do. Beloved, let me pause and tell you, you ought not be surprised when people do what you know they're going to do. Jacob tricks his father, Isaac, out of the blessing that rightfully belongs to Esau. Jacob steals the inheritance that belongs to his older brother. And the Bible says that when his mother, Rebecca, realizes what Jacob, the trickster, has done, she's got Jacob some good advice. You need to leave and go live with my brother Laban, who lives in Padan Aram, which is Mesopotamia. Why? Because Esau has taken a vow to kill you because of what you've done. 
Y'all, Esau ain't playing. He's not having it. Esau told Jacob, the next time I see you, it's going to be a misunderstanding and there's going to be some smoke in the city. So Jacob leaves to go live with his uncle Laban. On his way to Laban, he bumps in to Laban's daughter, his cousin named Rachel. And when Jacob sees Rachel, it's love at first sight. I know it's not in your Bible, but but in the H.J. Wesley translation, when Jacob meets Rachel, he hears Roberta Flack sing the first time ever I saw your face. Some of y'all too young to know anything about that. Jacob is smitten with Rachel. When he finally meets Laban, everything is well. They hug, they embrace, they welcome and greet one another. And Laban is excited because now Jacob has come to live with him and work for him. And Laban is all about making money. And so Laban says to Jacob, how much do I have to pay you to work for me? Jacob says, listen, Laban, let me tell you something. It ain't about dollars and it doesn't have to make no sense. I'm not here to get wealthy. This is what I want. Let me work for you. And in return, let me marry Rachel. That, that's all I want. I want her so badly that I'm willing to work seven years for her hand in marriage. Laban says, cool, I'm down with that. All you want is my daughter and I get you for seven years. If you work seven years for me, you can have her. So Jacob goes to work for seven years. After the end of seven years, it's time to get paid. It's time to have Rachel. The wedding is planned. Jacob goes into the tent. The woman, the bride comes in. The marriage is consummated. Only for Jacob to wake up and find out that Laban has pulled a married at first sight on him. He wakes up, and don't ask me how, but he realizes he didn't get Rachel that night. He got Leah, her sister, whom he does not want. And Jacob is furious because Laban has tricked him. The tension that's going to grow between Jacob and Laban it's a good place to pause right here and tell you something that I want to preach. It's a lesson that Jacob learns, and it's hope, I hope it's one that you've learned in life. And that is this, that when you operate in trickery, there's always someone trickier than you. I don't know who needs to hear this, but when you think you are slick, you will always meet someone who is slicker than you. When you think you are good at being evil, there's somebody eviler than you. When you're nasty, there's somebody nastier than you. I don't care how good you are at being petty. There's someone who's got a bigger degree and being pettier than you can be. Because when you are evil and when you are ugly and when you are nasty and when you are unrighteous, you will always at some point in your life meet your match. There's always someone who can be more evil. There's always someone who can be nastier. There's always someone who can be uglier. There's always someone who can be more unrighteous. If you are in the sewer, there's someone who can take it to the gutter. There's always someone who can be more unrighteous than you. And the word of advice I have for you today, don't let people take you down to their level because you give them home court advantage. And when you give them advantage, they will beat you on their own court. Don't let stupid make you stupid because stupid can out stupid show stupid. Don't let ugly take you down to ugly because ugly can out ugly your ugly. Don't let nasty take you down to nasty because nasty can out nasty your nasty. Jacob learns a very valuable lesson that evil always meets its match. What he's done to Esau has now been done to him. He wakes up, realizes he's got Leah, and Jacob is furious. He says to Laban, how could you do this to me? I worked seven years for Rachel. You know daggone well I didn't want Leah. And Laban's answer to him is simple. Well, Leah's the older one. I can't let my younger daughter get married. He says, but I'll tell you what. 
You can marry Rachel right now if you agree to work for me another seven years. I told you Laban is all about making money. So Jacob loves Rachel so much. He marries her right after marrying her sister and is indebted to work for Laban another seven years. Things between Jacob and Laban are not well. But it is then that the tension switches between Jacob and Laban. And now the tension is between Leah and her sister, Rachel. Two sisters are now engaged in some drama that beats any episode of Real Housewives you have ever seen. They battle back and forth to see who can have the most children and who can win the love and affection of Jacob. Y'all, can I tell you how this story goes? The Bible says that Leah is fertile and she bears Jacob four sons. When Rachel finds out that Leah's had four children and Rachel cannot have children, she gives her servant Bilhah to Jacob and says, now go have children with my servants that will be mine. Bilhah births two sons for Rachel with Jacob. When Leah finds out that Rachel's given Bilhah to Jacob, and Leah finds out she can't bear children anymore. She gives her servant Zilpah to Jacob and says, now you go have children with Jacob that will be mine. And Jacob fathers two more sons by another servant named Zilpah that Leah takes credit for. Rachel is not to be outdone. She wants to have her own children. And one day she sees Reuben, the oldest son of, of Leah, carrying mandrakes. Uh, listen, I don't want to get too complicated. Mandrakes were an aphrodisiac. Uh, they were a modern day Viagra, right? So uh, Rachel says, give me some mandrakes because Jacob needs some help. <laughs> and, and so Leah says, listen, I'll give you the mandrakes to help Jacob out. But in order to give you the mandrakes, you got to send Jacob back to me. And so Rachel goes home and sends Jacob back to Leah. And when Jacob gets there, Leah sings from the gospel of Luther Vandross. Let me hold you tight. <laughs> hey, if only for one night. And Jacob has two more sons with Leah and a daughter. Then Rachel uses the mandrakes. Come on, y'all, this is getting good. Jacob has a son by Rachel and then another son. Poor Jacob has fathered 13 children by four different women. L listen, leave your judgment out. I'm just telling you like your T.I. is. It's in the Bible. Jacob has 13 children by four women. And the tension between Leah and Rachel is a good place to pull over and preach two lessons of life. Can I give you two lessons of life from the tension between Leah and Rachel? Leah learns what I want someone to understand today. And that is you can't make someone love you. Jacob never says he loves Leah. And Leah continues to try to make Jacob love her. Listen, listen, I'm not talking to the young folk because you, you, you ain't lived long enough to understand this. If, if you're in your 20s, I'm not talking to you. If you're in your 20s, you probably still think that your lips, your hips and your fingertips are all it's going to take. So I'm not preaching to you. I'm talking to us who are on the other side of 35. And if you're on the other side of 35 and you've had some ups and downs and you've had some heartbreak and some heartache, you've put your all into something for it not to work on behalf of us who are grown and sexy in life. Allow me to simply tell it to you like this. Bonnie Raitt said it best in 91 and Tank sang it in 2010. You can't make someone love you. Somebody, you know that song. I can't make you love me if you don't. You can't make your heart feel something it won't. There's a grown amen on the chat right there. There's somebody that's grown enough to know you can't make someone love you. 
And there's a line in that song that's gospel right. There's a line in that song that resonates with all of us who are grown. There's a line in that song that every young man, every young lady needs to hear. And in the middle of that song, Bonnie Raitt and Tank put it like this. I'll close my eyes, then I won't see the love you don't feel when you're holding me. Ooh, wee, that just went through my spirit. Somebody knows. Someone can be holding you physically and have no love for you spiritually. I came by to preach to my young princesses growing up. I came by to preach to that beautiful black teenage girl. I came by to preach to that freshman on her way to college campus. And I want you to hear me clearly that giving yourself to him does not mean he will give his heart to you. I need to say that again. Some young sister needs to hear that giving yourself to him does not guarantee he will give his heart to you. You can't make someone love you. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two from Rachel and Leah is that children should not become pawns in the fighting between immature adults. Let me say that again. Children should not become pawns in the fighting between immature adults. Y'all, let me tell you what's sad about this fight between Rachel and Leah. Brooke, they literally named their children after their battling, after their insecurities, and after their desire to win Jacob's heart. Their children are named with the insecurity of the fighting of their mothers. Leah looks at one of her children and literally names him, uh, I've now won. Uh, Rachel has a child and says to her child, I finally beat my sister. Uh, Leah has another child and says, I got Jacob back. The children bear the name of the fighting between their mamas. Come by to tell you it's a shame when a child has to bear the marking of the immaturity of an adult. It's a shame when a child has to carry the weight of a parent's insecurity. It's sad to see a child caught in the pettiness of two adults who can't put aside their personal differences for what's in the best interest of that child. And I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but shame on you, Leah, and shame on you, Jacob, and shame on you, Rachel, for making your children bear the pettiness of your immaturity. Shame on you for taking out your insecurity on your child. Shame on you for using your child as a weapon against the other parent. Shame on you for dragging your children into court. Shame on you for taking out your hatred of someone else on your child. It's a shame when a child has to bear the marking of the immaturity of two adults. Shame on you, Jacob. Shame on you, Leah. Shame on you, Rachel. There's some lessons in this fighting. Well, let me get back to the story. So Rachel finally has her children. And Jacob begins to hear the Lord say to him, it's time to go back home and face Esau. And so Jacob goes to Laban and says, listen, my time is done. I've worked seven years to get Leah who I didn't want. I worked seven more years to pay off the debt for Rachel. I'm out of here. Laban doesn't want to let Jacob go. And so he says to Jacob, how much can I pay you to have you stay? Because Laban is all about money. And when Laban makes that offer, Jacob senses an opportunity to get Laban back for what he did to him with Leah. Jacob now realizes I've got a chance to trick Laban the way Laban tricked me. Go home and read your Bible. It's a little complicated, but ultimately what happens, Mel, Jacob devises a plan to breed his own livestock out of Laban's livestock and breed stronger genetic animals than Laban's. So in a period of six years, Jacob manipulates the herd 
so that the stronger lamb and cattle and oxen and goat belong to him, but the weaker ones belong to Laban. So for six years, Jacob is now tricking Laban the same way Laban tricked Jacob, the same way Jacob tricked Esau. After six years, Laban's sons see what Jacob has done and they're furious. They tell their father, Jacob has been tricking you for these last six years. Jacob packs up his wives, packs up his cattle, packs up his livestock and leaves and makes his way all the way back home. And on the way, Laban catches up with him. And when Laban catches up, it's on and cracking. It's ugly. It's mean. Jacob is mad. Laban is mad. And they get to the place where they realize God has called this relationship to an end. They sense that what was once productive in partnership has become toxic in relationship. They realize that what was once good for both of us now is good for neither of us. And it happens at Mizpah. You know what Mizpah is? Mizpah is that moment when you realize God has said it's over. Mizpah is when you realize this is no longer good for me. Mizpah is when you recognize no matter how much we enjoyed this yesterday, it has no tomorrow. Mizpah is when you get to that place of realizing you've got to walk away for your sanity and your well-being and your peace of mind and your joy and your own livelihood. Mizpah is when you recognize God has said, now may the Lord watch between me and thee while we're absent one from another. And one of the questions I ask about this tension between Jacob and Laban, what led them to Mizpah. How do you get to a place where something that was productive has now come to an end? Listen, listen, if you hang out in this relationship between Jacob and Laban, you're going to find that there are some signs and some signals that this relationship is over. Can I tell you when you know you're on your way to Mizpah? Can I give you some forewarning, some signs of a relationship that's headed towards Mizpah? Can I tell you when your job is headed towards Mizpah? Can I tell you when a partnership is headed towards Mizpah? Can I tell you when a friendship is headed towards Mizpah? Can I tell you when a relationship is headed towards Mizpah? Here it is right here. Part of the reason Jacob and Laban wind up in Mizpah Watch this, is because their perception of the purpose, the priority, and the practice of money is different. He hear me, here's what will lead you to a misper moment. When you all see money differently, when money plays a different role for you than it does for them. Some of us have lived long enough to declare that the one thing that will bring an end to any partnership, the one thing that will bring an end to a relationship, the one thing that will bring an end to a friendship is when you have a different perception of the purpose, the priority, and the practice of how you use money. Any relationship that's going to have some longevity in your life must pass the money test. What is the money test? It's that moment when you find out whether you all see money the same way. Let me tell you something. If your perception and how you use money is different, you're headed towards mispa. If money is a tool for you to build something, but a toy for them to simply enjoy life, you're on the road to Mispa. If they like to gamble and you want to save, you're on your way to Mispa. If their first thought with money is Gucci 
and your first thought is down payment on a house, you're on your way to MISPA. If getting an 800 credit score is your goal and they don't even know what their credit score is, you're on your way to MISPA. If you're a, uh, I get it next this time, you get it next time, and they are a uh, split the bill and I'm not going to pay the tip, you're on your way to MISPA. Somebody today, you live long enough to know there's a friendship that wound up at MISPA because you viewed money differently. There's a relationship that wound up at MISPA because you viewed money differently. Uh, th th there's a partnership that came to a MISPA moment because you had a different perspective about money and the relationship could not pass the money test. Can I push it? M Mark, here's what amazes me. Laban and Jacob separate over money. But the reality is that both of them were wealthy. Laban had money and Jacob had money, but the wealth could not save the relationship because it's not about the amount you earn. It's about how you see what you have. You can be in relationship with someone who does not earn what you earn because the problem is not how much you take home. The problem is how you see what you do, how you see what you have when you get it home. Let me see if I can push this. Laban is all about money. And Laban believes that with money, he can get whatever he wants. He believes with money, he can control Jacob. Have you ever met a Laban? Have you ever met someone that thought because of what they earned, they controlled everything? Have you ever met a Laban that thought their bank account gave them control over you? Have you ever met a Laban that thought that buying you a gift would make you forget how nasty they were to you? Have you ever met a Laban that thought that their money gave them the right to treat people any old way they wanted? Have you ever met a Laban in your life who thought that money allowed them to control everything? But Jacob is different. Jacob realizes it's not my money that's gotten me where I am. But he begins to realize it's only the grace of God. Look at how he talks to Rachel and Leah in chapter 31. He says to them, I know that God has blessed me. The difference is that Jacob realizes it's by grace of God. Laban believes it's by the control of his wealth and they see money differently. Laban thinks money gives him power. Jacob realizes it's only God that has got me where I am. And there is a difference between thinking your money's giving you control and realizing it is only by the grace of God. Laban looks at his life and says, look what my money gave me. Jacob looks at his life and says, look what God has blessed me with. The difference is that one of them realizes it is only by the goodness and the grace of God. Beloved, every relationship reaches a point where you've got to ask the question, what is the real source of our livelihood? What are we building on? What are we trying to attain? Is it money or is it God? Beloved, I came by to tell you that money is God's number one competitor for the devotion of your life. Money is God's number one competitor for the devotion of your life. That's why Jesus said in Matthew and in Luke, you can't serve two masters. Either money is going to rule your life or your love of the Lord is going to rule your life. What is ultimately in control? Our money or our faith in God? Come here, beloved. That's why, that's why God demands that we tithe. Hear me clearly. Someone, you've got it all twisted because you went to a church that was financially manipulative and they distorted your understanding of why we tithe. We don't tithe because God needs your money. God is rich in houses and land. God can do exceedingly and abundantly. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness of thereof. God doesn't need your money. If God needed your money 
tithing would be 90% and leave you with 10. God ain't broke. God doesn't need your money. The reason God demands the tithe is because God wants to know, does your relationship with me pass the money test? What do you put above me? And I need to know, are we on the same page with money? Do you trust that I'll take your 10% and bless you exceedingly and abundantly? Do you trust that I'm the God that makes a way out of no way? Do you trust that I'll open a door your money cannot open? Tithing is about the money test. Do you trust God? Let me tell you what I need in my life. I need people in my life who want to make money, but also know how to trust God. I need folk that are disciplined with a budget, but know that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we ask a thing. I need someone who knows how to save and someone who knows how to obey. I need someone who knows that there's some things money can buy, but there's some things only the grace of God can provide in my life. I need someone who sees both. No more Labans. So they come to Mizpah. Because their perception of money is different. Can I give you another reason why they wind up in Mizpah? They wind up in Mizpah not only because their perception of money is different, but watch as they get there because Laban does not encourage Jacob discerning the will of God. Hear me, Laban's problem with Jacob is that Laban does not care what the will of God for Jacob is. Remember, remember, after Rachel has her son, Jacob hears God say, go back home. Jacob goes to Laban and says, God told me to go home. Laban says, no, you're supposed to stay right here. No prayer, no fasting. No, let's think about it. No, pray about it. He simply says, I want you to stay here. Why? Because Jacob is good business for Laban. Jacob makes Laban money. And Laban does not want to release Jacob because his own selfish desire is to keep Jacob because of what Jacob brings to his life. Have you ever met a Laban who only wanted to be connected and keep you because of the wealth you added to their life, the joy you brought to them, the peace you gave them. It was causing you hell, but it made them heaven and they would not release you because you made them better. Laban never says, well, let's pray about it. Now, now watch this, watch this. When Jacob tells his wives, Rachel and Leah, the same thing, that God has told me to go home, Rachel and Leah in verse 16, this is what they say. Jacob, do whatever God tells you to do. I want to make sure you see the difference. Laban says, stay with me because it's good for me. Rachel and Leah say, do whatever God tells you to do. I want to make sure you see the two different type of people. There are people in your life who will respond like Laban, stay here because it's in my best interest. But I need some Rachels and I need some Leahs who say to me, you got to do what God tells you to do. Love and I came by to tell you, be careful of intimately and permanently connecting your life to people who have no discerning of what God has called you to do. Be careful of the Labans that only want you to stay because you're good for them. You need some people in your life who when you tell them what you want to do, the first thing they say is, have you prayed about it? I need some friends who when they find out I'm about to make a life decision, will say to me, well, let me fast with you for three days until you hear God speak. Don't you say I do if he's never said, let's pray. You need some folk in your life who are concerned about the will of God and say, we've got to pray until we hear God. And when you hear God, do what God tells you to do. Listen, you're on your way to Mizpah if you're with someone who sees money differently than you. You're on your way to Mizpah if you're with someone who doesn't care about what God has said to you. 
Can I finally tell you why you're on your way to Mizpah? Jacob and Laban wind up in Mizpah. I like this, Angie, because Laban brings out the worst in Jacob. Laban's presence brings out a side of Jacob that God is trying to change. Remember, Jacob's name means trickster. And when he left from his father's house, he left because he had tricked Esau. God sends him to Laban. But when God is going to send him back to Esau, he meets him in Peniel and changes his name to Israel, which means God prevails. Watch this. So God says to Jacob, I'm trying to change your name. I'm trying to change your character. I'm trying to change your spirit from trickster to trust God. But the problem is that Laban is a trickster. And when the opportunity came, you went back to being Jacob when I'm trying to make you Israel because Laban brings out the Jacob, but he doesn't encourage the Israel. Your relationship with Jake, with Laban, is holding you in a place God is trying to break you out of. God is trying to deliver you from. God is trying to change you. And I've got to end this relationship because it's holding you to something I'm trying to get you out of. Beloved, have you ever had a Laban in your life? Someone who continuously brought the you out of you that God didn't want you to be anymore? Have you ever been in an argument with someone and stepped out of your own self and looked at yourself and said, that ain't me? Have you ever found yourself doing something for a Laban that you wouldn't do for anyone else in life and you asked yourself, how did I get that low? How did I sink to that level? How did I start acting like that? Because Laban brings out the worst in you. So God says, listen, when you realize that this relationship is holding you to something I'm trying to get you out of, y'all got to get to Mizpah. When you realize that that job is bringing out of you that even you don't recognize, it's time to get to Mizpah. When you recognize that friendship is taking you to a level that God is trying to lift you from, it's time to get to Mizpah. Because Laban... Is bringing out the worst in you. They wind up in Mizpah because they see money differently. They wind up in Mizpah because Laban doesn't care about the discerning of God. And they wind up in Mizpah because Laban brings out the trickster and God wants to bring out the one who trusts God. They wind up in Mizpah. May the Lord watch between me and thee while we're absent one from another. Beloved, you know what? My whole life, I've heard that passage. And Bobby, I always thought that was the biblical way of giving a sanctified middle finger to somebody. But you know what Mispa is? It's not a curse. It's a truce. It's a realization that it's over. And at Mizpah, we not only learn how we get there, but Mizpah teaches us how to walk away. And that's where we're going to pick up next week. By the grace of God, we're going to come back to Mizpah. And in part three of this series, we're going to talk about lessons in leaving. How to leave in a way that honors God. May the Lord watch between me and thee while we're absent one from another. Man, amen. A mitzvah moment. That type of preaching from Pastor Howard John Wesley needs a response. And maybe there's somebody out there right now who does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, this is your moment. This is your opportunity. Perhaps you have a relationship, but you want to join 
with this community at Bates Memorial Baptist Church. All you have to do is call the number that's coming on your screen right now, 502-636-0523. If you want a relationship with Jesus Christ, perhaps you want to be a member of Bates Memorial, or maybe you just need prayer. We're all going through it and we all need to connect with somebody that can connect to the Lord. Go ahead and call that number 502-636-0523. There's somebody waiting right now, waiting to pray for you, waiting to guide you through this Christian discipleship experience. Or if you need just somebody to talk to you and, and, and help you navigate through life right there. Right now, today, don't wait another moment. This is your time and this is your opportunity to be connected to a community that's connected to Christ. Don't you wait another second. Your time is now. Again, 502-636-0523. We're waiting here at Bates Memorial with open arms for you. We love you. We care about you. And we want you to experience that mitzvah moment that the preacher was talking about in the preach word. What a word. A light unto our feet. A lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Please, ma'am, please, sir, don't you wait another moment. This is your opportunity for change and transformation. Won't you come? If you were blessed by the preach word in this moment, this Revival Wednesday, why don't you go ahead and tap in the chat, amen? Amen and amen, amen, amen again. Listen, listen, listen. Here at Bates Memorial, we don't want to leave you and we don't want to depart without a benediction. And a benediction is just a blessing as you face another day or you go off and do what, whatever it is that's next to you. But before a benediction, there are, are, are a couple of things that uh, we want to lift up for your consideration. Number one, there are ways to give if you were blessed by the ministry if you were blessed by the preach word if you've been blessed by anything that's been going on here at base memorial we can't do ministry work without your help amen and so here at base memorial there are five ways to give your sacrificial giving or your offering the first way to give is through our cash app that's dollar sign or cash tag bates memorial just go ahead and type that in and you can put in whatever it is that God has called you, directed you to do to give to the ministries here at Bates Memorial. Or you can give online, Bates Memorial, BatesMemorial.com. Perhaps you're a texter like me, you can text vision, text vision in any amount to 73256. We have people here at the sanctuary now and working regular working hours. You can drop off your offering here at Bates Memorial. That's 620 Lambton Street. And the next way to give, of course, you can mail in your sacrificial giving or your offering to Bates Memorial, 620 East Lambton Street, Louisville, Kentucky, 40203. If you're blessed by the streaming, if you're blessed by uh, the revival that's still going on all this month, we can't do uh, these things without your help. So please, ma'am, please, sir, if God directs you, find it in your heart to continue to give and bless Base Memorial. Of course, we're still in the season to be called to be faithful. And we pray that your faithfulness helps us make an impact in our community and the world. Amen. 
Amen, amen, amen. Of course, like I said, there's one last thing we want to do before we leave you with a benediction. Of course, like I said, a benediction is a blessing. We have a quick video uh, of the announcements and things that are still going on here at Bates Memorial. So uh, uh, there's uh, there, there are uh, important information that you need to know, and here they are. What's up, Bates Memorial family and friends? Listen, this is the year that we're serving with a made-up mind, and we've got a lot that you can get involved in. Check this out. Bates Memorial family and friends, it's October, and we're celebrating 35 years of pastoral leadership by our shepherd, the Reverend Dr. F. Bruce, and First Lady, Dr. Michelle Williams. Join us Wednesday, October the 20th, where at the 12 p.m. stream, you'll be blessed by the preaching gift of the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley, pastor of the historic Alfred Street Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia. And then at the 7 p.m. stream, by the Reverend Dr. Gina M. Stewart, pastor of Christ Missionary Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. But it doesn't stop there. The celebration culminates Wednesday, October the 27th, where at the 12 p.m. stream, you'll be blessed by the Reverend Dr. Frederick G. Haynes III, pastor of the Friendship West Baptist Church in Dallas. Texas, and at the 7 p.m. stream by the Reverend Jennifer Carner, executive pastor at the House of Hope Atlanta, where the pastor is the Reverend Dr. E. Dewey Smith, Jr. So join us the entire month of October as we celebrate 35 years of pastoral leadership by Dr. F. Bruce and First Lady Dr. Michelle Williams, and we're sure you're going to be blessed. Hello, my name is Sharon Brown. I'm a member of your Bates Health Ministry. October's health focus is breast health to prevent breast cancer. The CDC describes breast cancer as a disease in which the cells in the breast grow out of control. Although there is no cure, you can take steps daily to reduce your risk of contracting this disease. According to the Cleveland Clinic, here are five ways to boost your breast health. First, maintain a healthy weight. Your body mass index below 25 for women. Exercise at least 30 minutes on four to five days weekly. Three, stay hydrated and eat a balanced diet. Four, limit alcohol to one drink per day. That's 12 ounces of beer or five ounces of wine or 1.5 ounces of hard liquor. Five, take your vitamins, especially vitamin D. In addition to the above tips, be sure to do a self-breast exam monthly and get your yearly breast screenings from your doctor. For more information, contact your doctor or contact the Bates Health Ministry at BatesHealthMinistry620 at gmail.com. Calling all health professionals and health enthusiasts. Your health ministry needs your help. Please contact us to find out how you can serve. Again, this is Sharon Brown from your Bates Health Ministry. Hey, what's happening, Bates family? Listen, we're taking over ESPN. We call it the BFL. It's the Bates Faith League. Here is what our young people are doing at TBE. We are doing a two-minute drill. That's right, a two-minute drill where we're simply teaching our young people how to pray in two minutes. Ain't that something? That's crazy, right? All we're doing is reciting Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, and our young people are excited. Do me a favor. I hope you all are ready. Join us every Wednesday as we do what we always do, and that's go the extra mile. Join us at TBE. It's going to be off the chain. Let's go. Hello, Bates family. My name is Quisha Tony. I'm a family nurse practitioner. Um, hope all is well with everyone. I miss seeing everyone's smiling faces. I'd like to take this time just to kind of do a run through of this COVID uh, vaccination. I know the fear behind it. Um, people are skeptical on wanting to receive this, this so important um, vaccine. But however, I encourage each and every one of you to take the vaccination. It is safe. The point of this vaccination is to help with the symptoms of COVID-19. We've lost loved ones that's been placed on ventilators. We know people that are still experiencing long haul symptoms from this virus. So the point of this vaccination is to prevent those things from happening. So I encourage again, each and every one of you to just take the time, do your own research if you have to, to look up this vaccination, but know that it's safe. There's a myth going out there that People tend to think that they're being injected with the COVID virus. That's not true. People are thinking that it's some bogus government thing with chips being inserted. That's not true. 
This is the one thing that will keep us safe at this point. Again, COVID is not going anywhere. We have the fall coming up. There could be another wave. We, we don't know, but at this point, we would, I highly encourage each and every one of you so we can gather again to become vaccinated. Now that we have all been thoroughly informed, it is our prayer you will allow God to guide you as you make decisions for the well-being of yourself, those you love, and others within your proximity. If you have any other questions or concerns, I encourage you to go to the CDC website your PCP or primary care provider, or our local health care agencies to further assist you with your decisions. Until we come back to in-person worship, take care, stay safe, and may God continue to bless and keep you. That's what's going on here at Bates Memorial, and we want you to get involved. One more announcement before we give the benediction. Um, our Bates CDC is having an on-site covid vaccine clinic that's next wednesday october 20th um they're having the clinic from 12 to 5. Um, our cdc is located in 600 lambton street and it's going to be an outside event on the lawn so uh, all covid vaccines and booster shots uh, you can get those as well from one to five and of course the pe those people that are eligible to take the vaccine 12 and up uh, should come and and get the vaccine it's needed in our community it's very important and we urge all of you to get it if you need more details about that event from uh, again our bait CDC go ahead and call into us 502-636-05 uh, well 0573 for bait CDC and they can get you more details about how you can get that vaccine um, and uh, it's very needed and we encourage everybody to get it amen uh, this is revival day and we have a uh, if you were blessed by this message on noonday why don't you come back at 7 p.m. where there will be another magnificent grand message from uh, Reverend Gina Stewart uh, you know her she's been here uh, she's a dynamic preacher and you won't be upset that you came back and joined us for seven o'clock amen tell your friends tell your loved ones tell your enemies too so they can be blessed as well join us seven e 7 p.m this evening for evening wednesday revival and let's go to the lord in prayer uh, my prayer is for you that you continue to stay safe and be blessed let's go to the lord god we are thankful that you have called us to be in relationship with you god and that we are called to be in relationship with each other. God, we pray for healthy relationships no matter where we go. Now may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee, the Lord. Lift up the light of his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Be blessed.